Welcome back. You're watching Stock Picks. Today, we're looking to Spur, iShares Semiconductor ETF and Medical Properties Trust. And bringing us that analysis is independent analyst, Jim Moyaha. Jimmy, a pleasure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nolu. Nice to be here again. Nice for to me. chat to you, Jimmy. Let's talk about these stocks. Do they have anything in common? Uh, do they cover a theme? Or are you just loving them at this point? The, well, I suppose it depends on what you define as a theme. Okay. Um, they're intentionally diversified, okay. so covering so various <laughs> right, covering various <laughs> sectors okay. uh, for various reasons and looking at various elements within each stock. Mm -hmm. um, we could probably kick off with Spur because yes. that's probably the easiest one to yep. take a look at. They're a diversified restaurant here in South Africa, um, and where I prefer them to a famous brands is number one, they're trading um, almost. 40% cheaper in terms of share price, but more importantly, and this is probably one of the most important things at this time, is they are debt free, right? Mm. Now that means if we still have higher for longer, if we still have all of the things we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks and months around, uh, uncertainty as to when interest rates are gonna come down, companies like Spur that have no debt on their balance sheet, that have operations, can take advantage of opportunities, but also don't have to worry about the cost of repayment increasing uh, where it relates to interest payments. So I'm really liking that aspect of it. Uh, the share price has kind of stalled a bit of uh, over the last couple of uh, months of around this 30 to 35 Rand range. So I'm not expecting a breakout to 60 Rand overnight or something of the sort, but I do like the fact that they do still offer value. They have diversified beyond just the the Spur um, restaurant. There's uh, other components like the Hassar Grill and the other um, restaurants within their stable. So I, I like the element of looking into that retail space. South Africans have this remarkable resiliency around tough economic conditions and still wanting to eat takeout. So. Yes. Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the only bit of joy we're getting out of it. I actually wanted to speak to you about uh, famous brand, brands, mm. because I mean, you said you prefer Spur here. I want to put the two against each other a little bit, because famous brands, I just came up with an update. It was very disappointing. And Spur literally had a complete opposite uh, picture being painted here. Mm. They're supposed to be similar, not the same, but similar. Jimmy, what is Spur getting right at this point? So it, it's quite interesting because every conversation I have with Spur and I speak to the CEO Val about what they're doing is, is kind of stems from the pandemic. If you remember back in, Spur, in the 2020 pandemic, there was a point where we didn't think Spur would survive. There was a point where they were considering closing down all of the Spurs. They even tried this ghost kitchen model mm. and that didn't work out too well at the time. Um, they, they've since revisited a couple of things, of course. But I think the, the important thing was during that time, a lot of the companies had to relook at how you then approach the market, how you then look at the South African landscape and your South African consumer. Now, your South African consumer, if you're looking at a spur versus a steers, and I'm literally just picking mm -hmm. one from either side of the stable, mm -hmm. your spur is kind of more family friendly. Yeah. You've got that component to it. Family friendly doesn't necessarily mean... Um, easier business to run or anything, but it certainly does mean increased revenues. It means likelihood of more parties, likelihood of larger groups. Larger groups equals a larger bill, equals more revenue. Ergo, makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. if, if you go to a uh, steers um, and the sit-down uh, capacity of a steers is not the same as a spur, they get to, they have to do a lot more um, to achieve the same result in terms of uh, billables or, or, or revenues and that sort of thing. So I think Spurs model from that perspective and then coupling that model with a diversification across LSMs. So your price point at a Spur versus your price point at a Hassar Grill, mm -hmm. they're not the same, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the food that you're getting might be very similar in nature, but the restaurant themselves are not the same. And when you look at Spurs as a consolidated group, they're able to now integrate and consolidate the revenues from these other businesses into their uh, overall balance sheet. And that makes them even stronger as a business uh, and it, it allows them to leverage off of if one of the business units is not performing as well, one of the others might pick, it, pick up some of the slack on that on that side. Um, that being said, though, I, I'm not against famous brands. I don't mm. I don't think famous brands is a terrible uh, company to be looking at at this stage. Um, I'm when I looked at this particular pick, I had to look at three different picks. So mm. my um, thought process was. I can only take one or the other because I have the other two and I want to get sort of as much spread across the risk portfolio, especially in this time. Very interesting. I think also people love to have a dope while their kids play, to be honest. <laughs>
<laughs> and let's talk about the iShares Semiconductor ETF now. Uh, this is a very interesting one. I think uh, this sector, Jimmy, uh, every time I think it can't grow any bit more. Uh, there's a little bit of more growth. Um, I also know that NVIDIA, of course, leads uh, the sector in terms of, uh, you know, of course, semiconductors. But there's other little companies attached to NVIDIA that I think uh, might be offering um, shareholders a little bit more. But if you can't get into those, there's this ETF. Right. <laughs> and th this ETF was quite an interesting one. I had a conversation with David Shapiro about mm. it. And we were looking at the semiconductor space and to say exactly what you're saying, Nolu, is that at some point, we've missed the gravy train. Mm -hmm. You didn't get into NVIDIA at $100. Yeah. We've gone above $1,000, <laughs> right? So that's, but the nice thing about this particular one is if you take a look at the chart for this particular um, ETF, it's come down more than 60, 66%. So two thirds, um, it's lost its value from about 700 uh, to around 234, 235-ish. And what I'm particularly liking about that is your exposure to a lot of companies within the semiconductor sector. Now, there is another ETF out there that has a strong concentration towards NVIDIA. I think it's weighted around 70% uh, allocation towards NVIDIA. This one is weighted around 8% allocation. So this one's quite balanced in the approach that it gives you and the exposure it gives you into the semiconductor space. If the sector is to continue growing, this might be a good golden opportunity to get in without having to take um, concentration risk from an NVIDIA. I mean, an NVIDIA that's run as hot as it has, uh, getting in at $1,000, understanding that a retracement, you don't really know if your retracement is going to stop at 800, 600, 400, or 200, mm -hmm. you know? And th that's, um, th the revenues suggest that there might not be a retracement anytime soon and that it'll continue to run hot. But at the same time, uh, investors need to be wary of the fact that you don't just pile into a stock not understanding that the, there's an element of risk when the stock has run that much. And if you, again, if you don't want exposure to just one, but you want exposure to the sector, it's quite a nice balanced approach. It's also very interesting um, because, I mean, like I said, as a retail investor, I never had the $100 for NVIDIA okay, initially. So I don't have the $1,000, okay, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, but for retail investors here sitting at home, uh, Jimmy, uh, how have they been able to manage to maybe find this ETF uh, if it is looking like something that is not reachable? Because I think for some people, it's like, oh, well, that's happening. It's nice, but it's so far away from me. Mm. Yeah, so the nice thing about iShares um, ETFs is they're one of the, more popular traded uh, ETFs and one of the more popular available ETFs. So you should be able to find it on your broker. You should be able to find it uh, through in your investment platforms and that. Uh, they Obviously, they would require some offshore exposure uh, because it is denominated in offshore currencies. So you would probably be using things like your discretionary allowance and investing offshore. Um, but it is definitely worthwhile to look at if you are looking at exposure into this particular sector. Again, it's a very specific play into the semiconductor space, understanding that there are companies like Taiwan Semiconductors in Hong Kong, there are companies like Intel and IBM that are still in the space as well. It's just that we just so happen to be um, mentioning NVIDIA more so than all of these other guys. So I think there's a lot of potential opportunity that might sit within that space, especially if you're looking at it from a longer term perspective. I did a quick social media check uh, for this ETF. And one of the things uh, that I still keep reading, and I still can't believe that I'm still reading it because I think we've long passed there, but people still think that AI is a bubble, um, that at some point, uh, you know, all of this is going to come crashing and burning to me. Let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at some point in history, we thought that Y2K was the end of the internet. We thought that 2000 was going to uh, make me, uh, it feels like I'm very old saying that, but <laughs> at some point I remember growing yeah. up and that was the conversation. Yeah. The year 2000 is going to come around. We don't know what's going to happen. This is the end of the internet as we know it. Um, this after being uh, uh, an extended phase of the internet just being a facade, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the AI conversation the further into the conversation we go, the more you start to realize that it is kind of here to stay and not necessarily. So I think there must be a distinction between understanding what we mean when we say artificial intelligence and its uses um, versus things like virtual reality and those VR headsets that were a bit of the craze uh, a couple of months ago. So. Artificial intelligence can fundamentally th change the way we do business. Mm. So everything from how a business processes its uh, clients, how a business runs its internal systems, how a business identifies threats, deals with its fraud. AI has applications in real world today. It's not just going to be used to drive autonomous vehicles yeah. or um, used to switch Take your lights on and off. Or, yeah, no, no, yeah, no. They're yeah. they real world practical applications. Mm. And what you're realizing is these things require power. They require processing power, processing 
processing speed, that's where the chip manufacturers come in. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what your use case is for it, you will need something to process uh, what you want to do. So I think to look at artificial intelligence and say it's going to not, it's not going to be around for much longer is a bit of a, a scary gamble that I wouldn't want to take. Um, but at the same time, looking at where artificial intelligence is going, we're not, again, we're not just going to be using it for programming one or two things. It could really revolutionize virtually everything that we do. And at the core of that is the semiconductor space because that's what powers it. Very interesting. And I'm glad you've pointed that out for anyone who is skeptical about that. Let's move on to Medical Properties Trust. When I was reading about this company, I really feel like, Jimmy, there's some companies that only work in the United States mm. or work abroad. Mm. In South Africa, I tried to think of the same, but I'm like, mm. I don't know if this could work. Let's talk about this company. Well, in South Africa, I spoke to a company just last week mm -hmm. that has a very similar operating mm -hmm. model of sorts. Uh, that would be RH Pupillo. Yes, um, okay, okay. They reached a billion rand in net asset value. Mm -hmm. Big move for them from last year. 19% uh, growth in NAV there. But looking at MPW, um, there's a couple of reasons why this kind of works out, right? So very good dividend play, 10% dividend yield there, um, or just north of 10%. But that is coupled with a couple of other things. They are somewhat of a real estate play, not just directly in the medical space. So in the medical space, they um, are the largest uh, owner of private sort of medical assets or medical f uh, facilities in the US. They've got operations in Europe and in South America. And on top of that, they focus on the real estate aspect of it. Now, what's interesting about this real estate aspect of it is their largest tenant, uh, I believe it's the Stewart, uh, Stewart House, Mm -hmm. Their largest tenant recently went uh, and filed for bankruptcy. Uh, now this is oddly a positive. You'd think okay. this is a wrong. Yeah. This is this is a scary time, right? But um, MPW had previously written off uh, probably close to about six billion dollars uh, worth of rentals and fees that they thought they would not be able to recover. This bankruptcy now brings into the fold the fact that um, the Stewart Group has to sell their hospitals, and that could potentially provide a windfall for um, previously written off debt, which obviously comes in very handy when you suddenly have an influx of cash that you had previously accounted for as a loss. So I'm expecting that uh, there's going to be quite a bit of posit positivity from this perspective. And if they don't recover the full amount, at least what they do recover, they might decide to return to shareholders mm -hmm. in the form of uh, increased dividend or a special dividend because the amounts had been previously considered written off. So that's, there's a couple of really good components around the business. Uh, you've got your real estate play in there. You've got uh, the fact that they dominate the, the US market in terms of size and scale. Uh, but added to that, it's always good to have a win for, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I want to speak also about uh, the cost here, yeah, because of course that matters a lot uh, of valuations, uh, rather, uh, Jimmy, from uh, a retail investor's perspective here. What are we looking at? Um, I think the share price is around $5.50. So not the most expensive share to be looking at at this stage. It bounced off of, let me have a look quickly. I've got it somewhere here. Bounced off of just under $3 at one stage in 2022. I'd probably say around January of 2022, we were as high as uh, $24. So you're getting in at less than a 50%, more than a 60% discount uh, on the, actually, I think it's closer to 75%. Um, so you're getting it at a really good price. It hasn't been this low. So um, I'll give you a quick squiz mm -hmm. now. I'm just looking at the charts. Okay. Haven't, hasn't been, the, hasn't traded this low ever. Hasn't oh, traded wow. below. Uh, the historic lows were sort of around the ten dollar mark. Mm -hmm. We breached those lows around February of last year, um, and now coming into where we stand at the moment, we are around five dollars fifty, having bounced off that three dollars. So you're getting in at a fairly decent discount, mm -hmm. um, and you should be able to to enjoy some of the upside from here. I want to actually want to speak about that, that upside, uh, Jimmy, and the, the uh, you know the, the fundamentals that might support that upside for this business, maybe even looking at a real estate um, and medical real estate uh, globally here. Like you're saying, Iris Rupillo, one of the few players that might play in it, very small, uh, maybe just helping us get a better perspective on how uh, the sector moves. So if you look at the medical real estate side of it, it's more, a, a lot of it is, a, is geared towards the private sector, mm. obviously. And uh, in South Africa, obviously, we know that the NHI is recent developments. There's a lot around <laughs> that. Um, but the NHI stands to benefit the likes of uh, our age propeller because their focus is on low and affordable uh, medical services and medical offerings. So if you look at their locations of the private 
private hospitals that they own. I mean, there's a clinic in Heelbrow, and, and you're, you're not finding that it's your Mediclinic net care kind of uh, price point from how they've approached their business. That's our H. Popillo side. In terms of just medical um, in, in general, medical expenditure in the U.S. is one of the top things that the U.S. citizens prioritize. So when they look at that, it is something that they want good health care. They want to be able to look at those assets. And being in the real estate component of that means you can construct, um, you have your model, you understand the business model. Uh, someone like a steward house is an anchor tenant across multiple um, spaces. So they can say, look, we've identified a need in this area for construction. You come in as MPW, you construct, uh, you've already agreed on how your model is going to work, what price points are coming in. And for you, you kind of dabble into the real estate component of it, but also the infrastructure component of it, right? And America is very big on putting America first and going to American uh, companies and Ameri supporting American brands. So the MPW business kind of has longevity within their own market. And then beyond that, they're expanding into South America, they're expanding into Europe, and you're seeing that there is an increased need for healthcare around the world, regardless of sort of which country you sit in. So it's very interesting to look at the medical space, and it's more interesting to look at it from a physical um, bricks and mortar infrastructure real estate space rather than a premium space. Yeah. Because yeah. the moment I can't afford a premium, I sort of look to cancel it or look to move to a, a cheaper plan. And then your discoveries and the likes that offer those plans might see their side of the business being affected. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if I need a hospital, it's going to be a physical hospital. 100%. We're not going to we're not going to consult a surgeon via Skype of sorts, you know. So those aren't going to go away anytime soon, I don't think. And if if they do, then <laughs> I'd be interested to see how we how we solve that problem. So I think there's a lot of still uh, potential benefit and upside. And the model that MPW operates under is one that I particularly like. Brilliant. So now for our retail investors sitting at home, I've got some money to put in here. What order would you uh, invest in uh, these uh, three? Of course, uh, the ETF is not a stock, but <laughs> what order would you go in on here, Jimmy? Um, so I, I kind of, I prefer the alternative space historically. Okay. So mm -hmm. I would probably put Spur last for that sole reason. Okay. But at the same time, retail investors that might only want exposure to RAND denominated things might put that first. Uh, I'd probably put MPW first, iStocks in the middle, and then uh, the Spur group last. Not because they are the underperformer of the three, just different considerations around how to invest in them, how to gain exposure. Again, two out of the three are offshore uh, kind of exposures and a lot of retail investors might not want that or might uh, have reservations around how to get access to that. So just purely on where they're located, that's how I'm ordering them. Well, Jimmy, always informative, always fun. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. That was independent analyst, Jimmy Moyaha.